It's not easy to tell strangers about being sexually or physically abused, but that's what IAP claimants have to do. They need support. As Kathleen Martins reports, many of the people we interviewed did not get it. This is St. Paul's Indian Residential School. It's one of two former residential schools on the Blood Reserve in southern Alberta. People live here in apartments now. But it's the place Annie, Doris, and other survivors we spoke with say ruined their childhoods. A fact acknowledged during the Prime Minister's apology. Physical and sexual abuse and neglect of helpless children and their separation from powerless families and communities. Aaron Tallow says his time at residential school also ruined what was left of his life. He was six, he says, when he was forced to live at St. Paul's. He says he endured sexual assaults and repeated physical abuse from a school supervisor. So I know you don't want to talk about what happened to no. you, but what has been the effect on your life of, mm. of that abuse? To not think about it, to be alone. I don't trust anybody, even with my own ex-wife, I don't, I had to be alone. Another side effect acknowledged by the Prime Minister. Residential schools has contributed to social problems that continue to exist in many communities today. What would you have liked to do with your life? Stay sober, be a grandfather, continue with my life. Aaron stayed sober the night before our interview, but he says he was drunk through most of his compensation process. He remembers Tom Denom filled out his compensation form and that he then became a client of David Blotz. A lawyer Aaron says made him feel embarrassed in this crowded Cardston restaurant. Instead of saying that, just how much are you going to get? And there's a bunch of people behind. We're facing out the window. Started talking. Then I was drunk, my son kept looking around towards the back. The whole people, a bunch of there. It's making a big scene. Aaron says Blot met him at this Cardston Hotel for his compensation hearing. He said 240000 When I went down there to sign those papers, he said, You're going to get 130000 I didn't care. You didn't care? No. Why not? Because at the time I was drinking. But he says social workers on the reserve became alarmed at the amount taken off and talked about going to the police. Aaron doesn't know if they did, but he says he was never interviewed. Part of the compensation payout gives survivors money for aftercare treatment. Aaron says he wasn't aware of that, but admits to going on a drinking binge after telling the adjudicator about his abuse. Officials overseeing the compensation process say they are aware of the trauma involved. They also know survivors are not typical clients. Like in a courtroom, a, a, a lawyer on the other side would say, well, you said, you know, here, and now you're saying this, which, which is a lie, you know, you see, it, and, and that happens in court. An adjudicator would never do that. They'd say, well, you, you know, early this morning you said this, and this afternoon you said this. Uh, I, I, can you explain how the two fit together? Who is it uh, who's, over, who's supposed to oversee clients' rights when it comes to dealing with their lawyers? Is it you? No. Okay, who is it? The client. The client and the law society. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it sounds like survivors were left to navigate the compensation process on their own. It has taken extraordinary courage for the thousands of survivors that have come forward to speak publicly about the abuse they suffered. Marie Goodrider says she did what she was supposed to do, complain to the Law Society of Alberta about her lawyer, David Blott. She says she told them he kept her waiting three years for her compensation payment, charged her high interest for three loans, and sent another lawyer to the actual compensation hearing. He came up to us saying, okay, everything's going to be okay, we'll look after you. But it didn't even happen, no counseling, nothing. He got his money and he just ran. <laughs> That's what I felt like. <laughs> So did you Marie says she received $2,500 and an explanation. After building up, telling me I'm going to get this much, he said, I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I'm sorry to say we had a bad adjudicator. So he turned around and 
covered himself up. He blamed the government. Marie says she should have been angry. She still lives with a painful head injury and memories of sexual molestation suffered at residential school. But she wasn't as strong back then and says she was used to the system keeping her down. And all the nuns said, oh, you'll be okay. You'll be okay. Like I wasn't taken to a doctor or nothing. Like I was hurt, but I was scared of what they'll do if I complained. I lived in shame because I always remember being stripped and my haircut, I always remember that. And I thought, well, why, why am I trying to respect myself now? It's already been taken away, so I guess it's everybody's now. Marie says she lived on the street and abused substances for many years. Like Erin, she says she never trusted people again. Punishing myself for what these people put me through, how I had to live it. Yeah. And they're going to come and tell me the government apologized to me. They might as well. When I was sick, they should have dug a grave right there and buried me. At least I wouldn't have to live all these years with the, all that hardship. Form filler Celeste Barassa says it was people like Marie she worried about while working for Honor Walk. I'm pretty sure that wasn't their intent, but it feels like we almost re-victimized these people. Kelly Bush also wants survivors to know she feels bad about what's happened. Bad enough to go against the advice of a criminal lawyer in Saskatoon. I have... I have been... I have been unable to sleep because of the stress because I'm so concerned for the people. Even though that criminal lawyer told me to not talk about this, I want to talk about it so that people, so that something can be done, so that something right can be made from the wrong, because that's what this settlement package was about in the first place, to make something severely wrong acknowledged and to do something good with it. Again, something the apology and subsequent compensation program was supposed to do. Therefore, on behalf of the Government of Canada and all Canadians, I stand before you in this chamber so vital, so central to our existence as a country, to apologize to Aboriginal peoples for the role the Government of Canada played in, Indian, in the Indian residential schools system. Marie says she did not get a response from the Law Society. But she did get something else, she says, her voice. I chose to speak because this should be brought out in the open, I feel. Not just for my sake, but for the sake of others. And the apology, in my, in my own words, doesn't mean nothing. APGN Investigates Kathleen Martins will be back with the final act of our story after the break. Chief Charles Weaselhead has been pushing for someone to do something about the many complaints he's been hearing for a year or more. Others have been trying for even longer. Here's Kathleen Martins with the conclusion of our story. To signify that the Prime Minister or the inductee will carry out his duties. Prime Minister Stephen Harper was made an honorary chief of the Blood Tribe in Southern Alberta in July. It is an experience I will never forget. This special experience came with a personalized title in the Blackfoot language. The Prime Minister was named Chief Speaker, says Chief Charles Weaselhead, because of the residential school apology he issued in 2008. I know that the Blood Tribe was deeply affected by that system. The sacred ceremony binds Harper to the tribe and he is expected to look out for its interests. Weaselhead said Harper, through the apology, set the tone for rebuilding Canada's relationship with Aboriginal peoples. 
That's why he feels wounded by complaints involving a Calgary law firm and blood survivors seeking redress. When you begin to hear stories like you say over and over again, you know, then it makes you wonder what's happening. And I suspect that we're not the only ones here in Alberta and the Butt Tribe that there is a, a, a national concern about the way the process has been handled for each individual, you know. So I, I suspect that you're going to find that more individuals are going to come forward, you know. We don't have a choice but to deal with this issue at hand. Weaselhead spent 11 years at St. Paul's Residential School something he says he's still coming to terms with. He knows it's been harder for some. We've heard stories of people trying to take their own lives. It's t because they've been waiting so long to hear something from their lawyers in terms of their application. What have you been hearing about that? It's, it's a waiting game for them. It creates frustration, anxiety, which may lead to uh, other uh, activities, you know, that... Uh, they may take their lives, you know. Adding to the pressure, says Weaselhead, is a deadline. Survivors have until September 2012 to apply for individual compensation. Daniel Ish expects Canada to compensate an estimated 30,000 survivors. What's it been like for you being part of this process? It's been a really difficult job for me, you know, because there are so many competing interests. Um, um, there's lots of money around, obviously. Uh, my best guess is we will award uh, more than two billion and less than three billion by the time it's over. So that's a, a lot of money out there. And if you just take the av you know, average legal fees on that, say if it's two billion, uh, 20 percent, there's, there's lots of money out there. And lots of money always brings people with uh, hard lines and so forth. In total, Ish predicts $5 billion will be spent on administration expenses, lawyers' fees, and compensation payouts. But what the lawyers did to earn those fees, he says, is not his concern. Our concern is to make sure that those files are handled properly in our process so that they're going through the stream so that we can meet, get the job done. Legal experts tell APTN Investigates that lawyers soliciting clients directly or through third parties is problematic, that it is seen as putting the lawyers' financial interests ahead of their clients. But with no compensation ombudsman or appeal process to turn to, former form filler Celeste Barassa believes survivors continue to pay the price. I'm supposed to hear these people's worst, horriblest stories, things that still, like this, the 80-year-old man who still has nightmares and just walk away from it and never hear from him again. And I don't know if he, I don't know if he got his hearing. An update for you now on some of the people featured in that story. Elder Annie Plume passed away. Her funeral was last week. Aaron Tallow's ex-wife also passed away. APTN Investigates spent six months digging into complaints from survivors about their experiences with the IAP compensation process. British Columbia Supreme Court Justice Brenda Brown suspended Blot & Company from contacting clients on October 31st. On November 10th, Justice Brown lifted that suspension, but also ordered an investigation into these matters. That investigation continues. Kelly Bush was asked to turn over her documents to the court monitor last week. She complied. There are more details on this story, and tomorrow you'll be able to look at the documents on our website, www.aptn.ca. Good night.